we can, we can, I can get started. I'll just do like a general introduction and we'll see. So, welcome. Thank you for joining this session. Uh, I'm super excited to be able to share this stuff with you. Um, it's something, it's a lot of insights. Uh, um, a lot of thinking that has gone into a lot of nuggets that was really hard to turn into like a story <laughs> that was actually going to be congruent. Because there's a, um, uh, there's a lot that I want to share with you. Uh, um, I, now, I worked a lot on it, so I think we should, should be good. Uh, but if there's any questions at the end, I'm happy, happy to, to uh, go deeper in on things. So, um, uh, back when this whole AI hype craziness started, um, one of the first questions for me was like, oh, crap, <laughs> what, what, um, how, how is this going to change things? Like, um, we will still have websites like we know it? Um, no, I, I've calmed down a little bit from that. I, I don't know if you had the same experience. Um, um, but it, it felt a little bit like a closed web all over again, the Empire Strikes Back, right? Um, uh, where um, there was this potentiality of LLMs becoming the primary and only interface through which we would access the internet. Now, um, we've all calmed down a bit and they've done some further thinking. I have some, uh, um, some parallels that might also explain why uh, that probably won't happen. Um, but still, there's, there's some interesting changes uh, uh, at the horizon. And um, yeah, um, how do we deal with all of this stuff? Um, also, maybe, you know, every threat is always an opportunity. Like, I, I really love stoicism. The obstacle is a road. Um, I think that every challenge is an opportunity to rethink what you're doing and to maybe um, become better uh, instead of um, weakened. And I think um, this definitely is one of those. Um, because maybe this could be an opportunity to uh, double down on the open web. And I'll explain why uh, in a moment. And there's this, th this is a, a way of framing it that came up yesterday <laughs> in conversations. It's like, maybe we could have like decoupled Drupal with Drupal as the back end, but AI as the front end. Ooh, <laughs> that's, uh, that was, uh, no, that, that's, uh, I, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll do justice to this sentence in, in the talk. But, you know, this, this is some of the things in the back uh, of your mind, maybe. Uh, very, very short words about uh, my company. Uh, we're Pronovix. We're a consultancy that specialized in developer portals. That's all we do. We started 18 years ago in Drupal, uh, first as a Drupal engineering company. And about eight years ago, we um, like niched down. Like we became uh, a complete specialist in doing only this one thing. Uh, like I did back then, I did presentations at Drupal Cons about how we needed like a thousand niches and we should all like niche down and, and specialize in stuff. Uh, we, we drank the Kool-Aid, <laughs> we actually did this thing. Uh, practically it meant that uh, we started investing a lot more in the API community and promoting uh, uh, Drupal as a solution in the API community for developer portals. Uh, we organized conferences for uh, API the Docs is a conference about API documentation and how to build great developer portals. I, I will, I, I don't know if you're all familiar with the term developer portal. I'll explain that in a second. But um, um, so we really focused on this. Um, and uh, last month, we actually had a conference about AI, APIs, and documentation, and like some early findings from the field. What are people actually doing with this stuff? Uh, and um, yeah, well, we, we're uh, right now, it's still something um, you have to like buy access to, but we're all releasing uh, uh, presentation as we go. Um, um, I also um, start, uh, I'm also host of a pod, well, two podcasts, uh, API Resilience podcast, which I started together with Mark Winberry. I don't know if anybody knows Mark from back in the Yakra days, maybe, yeah. Anyway, so with Mark Winberry, we started this and then it's evolved. Um, right now, I'd, li I, I'd like to call it the API philosophy podcast, where we talk about how things are changing uh, in the API world and, and like kind of like what kind of new future we might be seeing at, uh, at the horizon and like applications of AP uh, APIs and, and uh, you know, 
there's some complexity mixed in. So if you love complexity science, there's some really, really good episodes. Um, there's um, yeah, some, some, field, uh, some stuff from people that are actually in the trenches doing things with APIs. Um, ha have a listen if you're interested. So some of the stuff I'll be talking about in this talk has developed through conversations with a lot of amazing people uh, on this podcast. Now, what am I going to talk about? Um, so as I said earlier, I already, already hinted at, it was hard to like create one story from all of this. And I had something really abstract before. But then it was like, actually, we can make this much more simple. We can just make it about, number one, enabling bots to do things. Number two, enabling bots to do all the things. <laughs> number three, <laughs> enabling bots to make the world accessible. And it's like, it's an interesting, well, you'll see. I'll, uh, uh, I'm curious how, if you'll see the same as I am seeing. And then number four, uh, bring it all together and how do we do this stuff with Drupal and how do we build the open interface web? First, enabling bots to do things. Um, uh, another view on AI. So November um, 30th, 2022, uh, big AI day <laughs> when ChatGPT launched and then suddenly this new hype wave that we're all going through um, uh, like, you know, got started. And, and, and I don't know about you, but for me, this feels like the biggest hype wave I've ever been in. And it's like, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? Um, um, uh, and, and there's so many pundits, there's so many people, and you've heard this before, everybody starts their AI talks with something in this genre. Um, like, we don't really know what's going on. It's like, is, is this going to, there's people saying that, uh, this is the singularity, everything's about to change, Skynet is on the horizon. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's pretty crazy. Um, but if you, for all of us here, people working with Drupal building websites, there's some scary questions that you can start asking. It's like, will websites be obsolete soon now? <laughs> like, uh, now, I've thought a lot about this, and actually there's a parallel with how WeChat works in China, because um, in China, or this was from, um, um, this was an innovation manager from BMW who told me this, that um, in China, a lot of interactions happen through WeChat. Uh, and, and basically, that's their primary operation system for doing stuff. Which is kind of like, if you think about it, it's kind of like a chat interface. Well, it's like the same thing, right? So, but as far as I know, they still have websites there. So websites will not go away. At least let that be a <laughs> first thing. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's reasons for it because uh, you, you have this multimodality that helps you to create better trust interfaces. If you, if you have the quality, you can create like better production quality information. And it, it just gives a different experience that, um, uh, you know, you will need that next to, uh, um, you know, even if this becomes a dominant thing, we'll still need this also. This is kind of like what happened with mobile. I've talked to people in banking and they also talked about like, oh yeah, you know, mobile banking is gonna be the only way that we're gonna do things. And that actually it's not true. We're doing, we like to do things in different ways. So number two, will CMSs become obsolete? That's um, also an interesting question because you could imagine a world where you're using AI to generate pages. Uh, maybe like you, 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 I don't know if you do it with prompting because I think this is a bit overhyped with, with LLMs and, and the prompting thing, but you, know, you could use machine learning technology and pipelines and whatever to, um, to apply markups to content. And maybe we don't need CMSs anymore. And this is something that has been playing in the documentation world for quite a while. Uh, like we've seen this with people doing like the static site thing where you have like markdown and then you generate the site with it. And then people are like, oh, we don't need no stinking CMS anymore because we can just go into Git and edit stuff and you know have version control. It's all there. Why do you need this? There's reasons, um, but you know, it's another question that probably a lot of you have been asking. The thing that helped me the most was to, to think about this not as one singular thing. It's not like AI, the monster. It's a bunch of different transformations. 
that are more or less likely to happen sooner or later. And once you start thinking about it in that way, um, you can start piecing out different transformations that might happen and have an impact on all of us, uh, and like their likelihood and, and how things might change. And you might start looking for like groups of transformations and how they will transform things, and what that means, how we need to prepare and change uh, what we're doing today. So there's three that I've highlighted. There's actually four embedded in here, but there's two together. Uh, the first one is um, AI in, uh, embedded in existing software. This is nothing new. We've had machine learning forever. Uh, we've, we've been doing spell checks and all of this stuff uh, for, for a very, very long time. It's already here. Number two, um, centralized AI for everything, Skynet. Let's not talk about that. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we can't do too much with that anyway, and also I don't think it's that likely. Um, but number three is, I think the most interesting one, is um, generative AI uh, as a client or server site wrapper around other stuff. So like a, a generative AI um, as this bridge between how you think about the world and how the world thinks about the world and how organizations think about themselves and like something that helps you to find, to bridge that gap and to get over those um, uh, cognitive hurdles that we currently have in, in, in the world. And I think that's a much more uh, um, well, fertile place to, to go look for interesting things. Uh, because um, this is how it was originally um, pictured. It's like, okay, so you have a human or maybe a machine coming to an LLM saying like, hey, I've got a question, can you answer me? And then it starts generating stuff and probably hallucinating, and then you get some answer, but it's purely based on the training that happened maybe one or two years ago, which is probably not a very good way of doing this thing. So one of the takeaways that I got out of uh, AI the docs, one of the, the, the things we heard over and over from speakers was that instead of just working with an LLM, they were using uh, what's called RAG, uh, it's Retrieval Augmented Generation, uh, uh, so that it was not just the, the model that was answering, but it was um, some content that was brought in to help with uh, answering the questions, also making it more uh, to the point and also um, checkable what exactly, um, you know, what was the source of, of this thing that this uh, oracle was spitting out. Um, and then basically what happens is that the LLM becomes a bridge between you and a document that's out there already. Um, or maybe an API, because then this is a really interesting one, <laughs> because um, uh, people started uh, building LLMs that can uh, interact with APIs to do tasks, which is fascinating. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, so there's there's a that, that little text bubble there that's a, a, a whole storm in the API community that I've been um, uh, encouraging <laughs> because the, the API world thinks about themselves as a product. Uh, so APIs are products in the API world. And I've been saying that maybe there are utilities and that, um, anyway, there's a, but there's a whole other story. If you want to learn more about that, go check out some of the blog posts and, and uh, podcasts that I've done. Um, now, one of the key things though is that um, if you want to be able to operate this kind of model, you need two things. You need APIs and you need good quality documentation. And this is the th one of the promises that I said, AI readiness. I believe that if you, if you don't want to just go completely crazy and spend lots and lots of money on, on a AI projects, like do some experiments. But um, I think that one of the best investments you can do today to be, to be ready for whatever this is going to turn into is to invest in having APIs and having good documentation. First takeaway. Um, now, this is what people do with developer portals. I, I was explaining earlier, uh, or I said, I promised that I would explain what is a developer portal. Who has heard about developer portals before? Some people. Okay, great. Uh, so. Uh, developer portals is something that grew out of the whole API thing. Um, and uh, the whole API thing, when I say that, because I, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but um, there's this other universe where people built API products 
that then other people can go and consume and do interesting things with that you might not have thought about. Or so that you, you can have like an integration without having to do the integration work on your end over and over and over again. You do it one time, you publish it as a product, an integration, well, kind of an integration product. And from now on, people can just use that to build uh, the connection with whatever they are trying to do, whatever application they're trying to do. Developer portals are websites. Um, a typical, well, can be outside, can be on the inside. On the outside, they're about building um, uh, ecosystems of companies or organizations. If you're in public sector, um, maybe um, you know, other non, not for profits, who, who knows, that are consuming your information or that are interacting with you um, to build like derivative experiences based on those APIs that you have. On the inside, there are tools for accelerating development. There are tools, uh, a developer portal helps you to build, um, uh, helps your developers to be more productive beca because they can have these um, reusable pieces of codes and functionality. Like, you know, instead of replicating your database 10 times er or every time you're building an application, you replicate your database, you once create an API and use it in every single application. That's much better, much cheaper, um, you know, and so on. Anyway, this is not a dev portal talk, but I, I think <laughs> I need to, uh, to uh, hint a little bit at it. Um, in this other universe, uh, in the API world, Drupal is actually um, pretty, uh, well, it's, it's, it's like, well, famous I wouldn't call it, but it's well regarded as one of the best tools to build developer portals with. Um, last week at API Days in New York, um, Mark O'Neill, mentioned Drupal as uh, a good tool, uh, like he mentioned Backstage with a product from Spotify and Drupal as the two tools with which you, sh you could go and build a, dev a great developer portal that is not like shut in into um, like one technology corner of, of, of the API world. Anyway, so there's a space where Drupal actually um, is well regarded for, for this kind of stuff. And um, now, while I was hinting at this, um, help bots to do stuff. So if you have APIs, if you have documentation, you could, and th there's like, this was a, a blog from NVIDIA, um, where there's, there, there were some early blog posts, um, I, I think even last year already, where people started talking about, um, you know, so I have this LLM and I'm just feeding it API documentation and it can do stuff. like. I don't have to, you know, I can just tell it colloquially, like, can you um, do X using this API? And it will actually do it, which is pretty, pretty radical because there's, there's some really, really interesting applications of that. Okay, that was number one. Enabling bots, number two. Enabling bots to do all the things. Um, API stands, for, who knew that API stands for this? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so um, in our world, in the Drupal world, APIs are typically about building integrations between a Drupal site and something outside or for decoupling, right? So that's, that's how we normally know it. But out there, um, um, APIs are used for building applications, for enabling consumers to do interesting things with your services uh, on mobile apps and stuff like that. Um, in the business world, APIs are completely transforming how we do things. Uh, the, the, the speed at which businesses operate, um, uh, the connections that they're building, building integrated supply chains, all of this kind of stuff are, is made possible because of APIs. So what is actually happening is that there's this you know, we've heard this digital transformation, but it means something different for everybody. I've, I've heard people talk about digital transformation as like, we're uploading our PDFs on a server, <laughs> so we're no longer printing. <laughs> and that, that's digital transformation for some people. What I really think it is, is uh, the, the build out of a, a layer, an infrastructure of um, digital interfaces that basically make the whole world programmable. Basically what we're doing is we're building infrastructure for magic. That's I think what we're doing. Because you can, you can do stuff at a distance. This is, this is really what magic is. Like, you know, 
knowing what happens <laughs> in another country is magic. Um, being able to open your door uh, while you're working at home to let somebody in to deliver package, that's magic. Um, so this, this is what we're doing here, right? Um, and if you, but there's another way of thinking about interfaces because um, if you, and I'm a bioengineer by education and I, I always have to drop in some, some weird reference. So if you imagine of your, uh, your organization as a cell with a boundary, um, then basically what we're doing is we're building um, uh, these, uh, um, well, these interfaces that are constraints that help us to transfer the information of what's happening inside to the outside world in a controlled way. There's a whole lot of interesting stuff here. Um, look up enabling constraints if you're interested in the philosophical side of this story. <laughs> um, there's a, a really, really interesting book uh, by Alicia Juarero uh, about, um, uh, it's called uh, Context Changes Everything. Really, really interesting stuff, a very, very um, meta, but um, uh, basically what it talks about is that this enabling constraints is what uh, make uh, complex adaptive systems adaptive. This is how we build these ecosystems that can deal with shocks and, and do all this amazing recovery and stuff. And that, that's, that's, I think, what we're doing here with, with APIs also. But coming back to our story, um, <laughs> we have this boundary of your organization with the interfaces that cross over it, and then you're building other interfaces on top of it, right? And then maybe you're also connecting to other companies or other organizations uh, through, through some of those interfaces. This is kind of like the picture that we're doing. Okay, I'll, I wanted to, I needed to settle this because I'm coming back to this in a moment. Let's double click on interface. What does this word evoke in you? It's like, <laughs> for, most, for most people, I've, I, I, I've talked so much about interfaces because it's such a, well, I, I think that interfaces are the electricity of our, gener well, our generation, probably our generation. So the, way, the same way that the rollout, like you wouldn't think about building a building without electricity today. I think the same way you will not even consider building an organization without having APIs tomorrow. Because all of these, all, all of this magic is made possible because you have that infrastructure in there. Uh, like, you know, the same way that you can buy a mixer on, on Amazon and then plug it in and it works. I think the same way interfaces, digital interfaces and APIs will transform how we do things in the future, but on, on this interaction level. Um, okay. Now, what are interfaces? According to the dictionary, interfaces are places where two systems intersect. It doesn't say much, right? It's just, you know, okay. <laughs> it's like where two things interact with each other, eh, okay. I think a much better way of thinking about interfaces, especially digital interfaces, is um, as the agreements, which is really important, that make interactions easier, okay? Let that sink in for a second. Um, because like, if it's just a place where two organizations or two organisms interact with each other, then every time you interact is different. But that's not how it works because we have all these standard ways of doing things, um, agreements that we've made, the way that um, we do things like a, like a phone book or a telephone number or a salesperson. A salesperson is an interface. Um, it's a, a person who is exposing a certain behavior to, uh, so that you know that if you want to buy something, you can go to a salesperson and buy from them. A support person or support line. It's, uh, uh, um, we know that if we want to file a complaint or get something resolved, we can go there and, and get something done. Social media, it's an interface. Um, all of, and, and the weird and interesting thing is that all of these have their own weird rules that we've learned by living and interacting and you know, learning about all of this stuff, which is really not obvious. And there's some really weird things here. Um, so I call this interface folklore. 
Um, and if you, if you start looking, um, like there's a telephone book, there's a contact page. So how do you find out if your organization has an app? You go to the app store. Okay, <laughs> and then you go and search to see if that organization has a developer account on the App Store, and then hopefully you're lucky, and it's actually the organization <laughs> that uh, that is uh, that that is published an application, or maybe there's like five of them, and you don't know which one is the actual one. It's really weird stuff. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, in the developer world, that's that's what they do with developer portals. That's where you publish your APIs so that people can go and find them. Um, now, one of my predictions, um, or my, one of my forecasts, is that if we're going to have LLMs doing stuff in the world for us, this is going to be a problem. Um, actually, it's already a problem today. Um, I'm getting a bunch of LinkedIn messages that are auto-generated, just blah, 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 whatever. People that are sending calendar invites into my calendar, I just refused one this morning. Um, People that are like hacking interfaces, how they're supposed to work, and like using like backdoors to, to make them do things they're not supposed to do. Now, if you add AI to this, it's going to be really, really bad. <laughs> um, so, and, and so one of the things that I think we will need to do is to become more deliberate about uh, what declaring what are the interfaces we have and how we want people to use them um, uh, and how we don't want them to use them. <laughs> so. Um, now, as I said, for APIs, uh, this is kind of what we're doing with APIs on developer portals. That's where uh, we, we publish APIs. Um, there's this um, a thing in the API space that's, that said that APIs should be discoverable and findable. Those are two different things. And uh, I think interfaces as a whole should be discoverable and findable. And, and, uh. Okay. I already mentioned um, that there's human interfaces, there's people that are acting as an interface for their organizations. How do we make them discoverable? Uh, like, because otherwise what's gonna happen is that, um, you know, uh, you're, you're gonna tell your LLM like, hey, can you, can you go and file a complaint with this company? It's like, can't find complaints, you know, support thing. I'll just send a message on LinkedIn to their CEO uh, or, you know, or, and, and it's going to be the LM doing it, so, it, you know, it's, yeah, there's problems here coming. Um, now, if we declare all the interfaces, um, then actually we could have bots do all the things and help them do it in a way that we want them to do it and, and create like, um, kind of like a new protocol of how we interact with other organizations uh, kind of like what we've done with telephone and electricity and all these other technologies that have transformed how the world works. Okay. Now, <laughs> who was here for the accessibility topic in, in the, the session? It's a few people? Okay. So I'll, uh, I need to make sure that <laughs> I give you something useful. Now, this is something I've been thinking a lot about because... Um, um, uh, if you start thinking about interfaces in the abstract, um, these accessibility regulations that are coming out, um, it, they feel a bit like a, um, a stopgap, I think, to some extent. Uh, and I don't want to, uh, so I think it's really important what we're doing. I, I don't want to diminish that, but I think there's more that we could do that could be more useful than uh, trying to make every single website accessible and stop there. I think there's a lot more that we could do to not only improve the experience for people that have um, accessibility issues, um, but also for all of us. Uh, like, you know, remember the, the interfaces thing? Well, actually that. Because if you think about interfaces, they play um, at least two roles. These are ones I can see. Um, uh, one side, they help us to have experiences, uh, like a website helps us to have an experience because you can go there, see some content, uh, get an idea, a feeling about an organization, uh, and, 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 you know, and on from there. The other side, they also have to help, help us to do things in the world. Uh, interfaces are uh, both of these, which is interesting. Now, there's, I, I don't know if there's anybody with red-green color blindness here? No? Uh, uh, yeah. 
I don't know, how is this look for you? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, um, this is an experience that um, we will not be able to make the same for everyone. Um, actually, if you think about it, we're all different. My mind works very different. I have this crazy associative brain that just makes connections where other people not always see <laughs> connections. Um, uh, so my experience of the world is different from, well, everyone's experience is different. So making experiences the same is not gonna work anyway. Um, so this part of accessibility, um, we can and, uh, uh, like lower the barriers to entry. Like for example, I should not put red text on green backgrounds that I really shouldn't do. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so I need to watch out for contrast. But I, I could have chosen other tulips, but then, you know, there's, there's a, a very, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of worms that you're opening, right? If you start thinking, uh, if, if, if we go down this route, then should we like remove all the red tulips or uh, it doesn't, does not, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but the interfaces that do stuff, those are really important. Like, so the experiences are important where uh, we have like artificial hurdles that don't make sense. We should remove them, obviously. But um, the interfaces that do stuff, those are essential. We should be um, enabling everybody to have uh, access to them. And, um, you know, and, and if you look at this from these two perspectives, I think um, it might also help with thinking differently about what you're doing with your website, because it's not just making all your content accessible, it's the affordances that are hidden in your content that are really important. And how are you gonna expose those and make those really easy to find? Actually, once you start thinking this way, maybe you can do a lot more for accessibility, not just for people you know, because of the accessibility standards, but because it actually makes your site more useful uh, and, and allow people to do more interesting things with what you're, you're providing. So now, if you think about APIs, um, they make this a lot easier because if you have an API, they're by nature, because they're programmable interfaces, they're by nature uh, multimodal interaction systems. It, uh, an API, you can turn into uh, a speech interface, you can turn it into a visual interface, you can turn it into a touch interface if you want to. Um, um, so, so, yeah, it's something to take away and to think about. Also, if you start thinking about this, universal accessibility is something that becomes possible. If, we're, if we become deliberate about our interfaces and we actually understand what are the affordances that we're offering to the world? Uh, what, what are the, the different ways that we want people to interact with us and that we want to expose, or some that we don't want to, but we have to, then um, we could make uh, um, the world completely accessible for everybody, um, you know, because there's always some modality through which people can interact with us. So that's why I think that if we're se really serious about accessibility, what we really should be doing is we should be looking at the interfaces and the sub-interfaces, because you could say like your website is like a whole interface, but actually there are certain aspects in there um, that we should be making discoverable and findable. And then we could really make a huge impact on, on making everything better. And not only making everything better, it will also be the first step for automation and for enabling um, something with AI or not AI or whatever, to, to, to um, build experiences that are um, uh, building what we have provided to the world into other experiences. Coming back to this diagram, um, this is pretty hard, like making all of the blue things uh, accessible, that's a lot of work. It's a lot easier to make these accessible. You know, if you have those APIs through which you're providing the information, um, and if you make those discoverable and findable, and if you have an AI bot that can interact with APIs to uh, help people to access our services and, and, and our interfaces, that would be a, a, a lot simpler and, and there's a lot more potential there. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't make our websites accessible, but it's something to think about if you're, if you're uh, being, trying to be um, 
uh, we're really serious about this. So, and, um, because all of this will, uh, I think, enable bots to uh, make the whole world accessible and, and everything that is out there if we, if we become deliberate about our interfaces. Okay, last point. Um, so how can Drupal uh, enable the open interface web? Uh, how do we bring all of this stuff together? So first of all, Drupal is already um, a leader in um, uh, developer portals. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Gartner thinks about Drupal as one of the technologies that you could use to build developer portals. Um, so um, it would be really great if you could figure out a way to also publish uh, non-programmatic interfaces in a structured way so that we can, we can make all of the, as, as I said earlier, we can make all of the interfaces discoverable and findable. Uh, because then Drupal could become not only a content management system, but also an interface management system. And um, uh, this is the vision that I wanted to check with all of you and, and, and you know, to get some feedback. Am I seeing like a mirage here? Or like what, I've, what I think I'm seeing is that maybe um, a Drupal could become like a, a system where you not only publish your content, but you do it in a structured way so that then people can find the interfaces that are embedded in it. Uh, and then, you know, not only APIs, but also other things that go beyond that. Um, and, uh, yeah. uh, and then, yeah, I think this, this could make the world more accessible and then also give maybe Drupal a role as infrastructure for artificial intelligence or uh, the wider world going forward. That's it for the talk. I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions or remarks or feedback? <laughs> Just There's a lot to think about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, really interesting talk. It, it made me think a lot about sort of the progression of, of science in a lot of ways, like how, how we came to this idea of a universal standard for HTML measures and you know, creating this kind of protocol yeah. for It's um, the way I got here and this whole utility stuff. Can you uh, the question? Yeah, sorry, sorry. So um, it was more of a remark <laughs> than a question, <laughs> but that it's um, uh, it's interesting to think about this because it reverberates with. Uh, I'll paraphrase. It reverberates with the other industrialization processes that are happening around us. The way I got here, and um, in an original version of this presentation, I was included, but it's it's too abstract, so I cut it out. I just, uh, there's 30 slides I cut out of, uh, <laughs> so there's, um, um, but I originally had Wardley mapping in my slides, and and uh, I don't know who has here heard of Wardley mapping. Okay, so this is a gem. Um, Wardley mapping is a tool to predict what is going to happen with technologies. And the guy who invented it, Simon Wardley, used it to predict cloud computing. Big deal. <laughs> um, so basically the way it works is that um, um, it, it maps out value chains uh, against the industrialization process. And then um, the, the core idea is that technology um, always uh, evolves from something that's like inception, just people are playing around with it, to custom to product to utility or um, or commodity uh, that that's that's like the, the trajectory that technologies typically take and what happens is that as one technology becomes a commodity more stuff gets built on top of it uh, in the value chain so in what you if you if you apply that to electricity for example um, the first electricity was just people playing around with frog legs and all kind of weird stuff. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, uh, and then as people like, got the hang of this, it's like, oh, this is interesting. We can actually run machines with this and we can like, turn the lights on. Um, that was always like built custom. Then people came with products that helped you to do this in a repeatable way. And then it became this utility that's like this network that you just like plug in the power cords, and now magically your stuff works. So 
some, this progression I also see in, in digital interfaces and in APIs. And that's, that's what's underlying, uh, underlying this talk. Yeah, yeah. So that there was a for for the records there was a, um, a reference to the design of everyday things. Um, so I uh, yeah I've I've heard a lot about it. I don't think I don't think I've read it yet. So yeah yeah. So I'll, uh, you need to check that out. Thank you. Um, questions remarks yes. So, um, so the question was, um, uh, do you think that it's possible to adapt existing API uh, standards like uh, Swagger or, or now Open API documentation uh, to to AI? This is actually what people are doing. So there's um, there's some tricky things like you have to authenticate. So you, so basically, what has I think where we are right now is that you can build an extension for ChatGPT, for example that will take an API and turn it into a capability that you can use in when, when talking with ChatGPT. This, this already exists. Um, I don't think that's the future because this is just like mobile apps but in your chat interface. Not sure because this is like what WeChat does so maybe it does work. I, I personally, I think at some point we'll get to where a point where you can just say, Hey bot, I'd like to connect with X, and then it just goes and look for how can it connect, gets the API manifesto, like the, the specification, looks at the documentation, like what kind of authorization protocol do I need to follow, makes a little bit of codes, just <laughs> you know. I think this this is the vision that we're starting to see, which is really, really exciting. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. <laughs> Um, there's limitations, but yes. Uh, other questions? You didn't expect this on Tuesday <laughs> afternoon at 4 p.m. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>